This is Rich Schmidt here with Scott Nelson at Resolute Cellars in Beaverton. It's January 26th, 2021. Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks for, uh, Thanks for having me on. First question, most important question, why wine? Why wine? Um, well, I guess I could get into the bigger answer of, you know, wine is a food. It goes with everything. It uh, has healthy quali qualities, of course, in moderation, like any, any alcohol. Um, the, the, the better answer is I've been a wine drinker, you know, most all of my, all of my adult life and some beyond that from some experiences in Germany when I was younger um, and uh, have always had wine around in, in small collections so I could enjoy wine whenever I wanted to and, and uh, especially with food and friends and, and family and the like um, and kind of stumbled into it and later in life it, it an opportunity to make wine and, and uh, as most people would say I was bit by the bug um, because I very rapidly went from making a couple of wines to 15 wines in the third year and and I've really never looked back. Tell us what you were doing before wine. Um, well, I was actually working a full-time job up until last year. Um, I, I retired from IBM a year ago um, and spent 20 years there and and prior to that 21 years in a uh, another business um, and, and really learned my chops on business side of everything um, and, and a lot on technology at the time at IBM. Um, I was more often in uh, management and business management roles, um, some in the areas of technology as a senior development manager, but a lot of business experience, so that's very, very helpful on, the, on now that we're a commercial winery and on the wine side of, of uh, or on the selling side of it you know, selling and, and compliance and tax reporting this time of year, mm -hmm. um, all that fun stuff, so. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned an, a kind of an opportunity came about to start making some wines. Tell us kind of about the, the beginning process of that. Yeah, so back in 2005, I was invited by a couple of friends, a couple of coworkers from IBM to, uh, to help them out with some winemaking. It was actually a bottling day, and uh, it was just the three of us, and and uh, my organizational skills, which you can see a little bit behind me, and, and just the, the fact that we're getting a lot done in a small space here, I, I lent that to them that day, and, and that led to being invited back uh, anytime I wanted to help them make wine, which I did for a couple of years, and, and as I was doing that, thought, you know, this would be cool if I made some wine at home one day, and in 2007, that opportunity came about with some fruit uh, available from the Myrtle Vineyard late in the season and uh, I, uh, I made wine from them in 2007 and made wine from the Myrtle Vineyard all the way up to 2000 and through the 2017 harvest um, and they sold the vineyard in 2018 so I didn't get fruit that year but uh, long relationship with the Myrtos and and really if you look at uh, all my vineyard partners their long relationships I picked up uh, Red Willow Vineyard in 2007 and uh, made a super Tuscan style wine and, and uh, well, I can't remember what else I made that year from them. Um, but in 2008, I also hooked up with a vineyard in Horse Heaven Hills AVA and I'm still using those two vineyards today for my big Italian reds and my big Bordeaux reds. So you mentioned before, before we started filming, you talked about the kind of the Murto story. I'm kind of curious about uh, what, what did you, 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 you got this opportunity to get these grapes, so tell us, kind of tell us how that came about and then how, what, what did you do, how did you know what to do with them? Um, well, I'd been making wine for two years already with, with some other guys, so I had the basic processes down. By this time I'd, I'd actually made wine together that was now in my cellar. Um, the very first one was a, a 2006 late harvest Riesling, I actually have one bottle of it left and I'm, I want to see what happens when it's 25 years old. <laughs> Um, because I've had a 22 year old Riesling before and, and so it's an interesting wine. Um, so I, I had this plan that you know someday I'll make my own wine and make it by myself start to finish. I, 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 I love to learn stuff I think on my LinkedIn profile one of my education things is the the school of life you know I'm always learning um, a lot of my knowledge of winemaking is is from reading and studying uh, seeking out mentors um, so anyway, this, this email got forwarded to me that there was a row missed by the pickers at the, at the Murtos. And there's actually, there's a row 
uh, row along the road that they call the row road, and it, it, you can see how it might get missed because it just kind of stands out from the from the other other uh, main rows of the vineyard. Mm -hmm. um, nobody else responded, and, and I was only going to get a couple hundred pounds, and you know, kind of try this out. I ended up getting close to 800 pounds, um, and uh, a lot of that at no charge, so that uh, it, with an agreement that I would bring wine back to them. And uh, the wine I brought back two years later was, was good enough, impressed them enough that uh, we continued on this path of getting fruit and making some wine for their personal inventory. Um, and when I started commercial in 2013, uh, we continued getting fruit from them, um, as well as adding uh, Tressler Vineyard in the Chehalem Mountains AVA that we got our Pinot from today. Yeah. We added them in 2014. So. So when you started making wine, what did you, what did you want it to be? What, what was your kind of philosophy behind the wine? So um, a couple of things that I mean I learned from a mentor that that aging two years in oak really makes a difference, and I've seen that now after uh, 14 years of, of uh, 14 harvests so far. If you didn't catch that from the first one here in 2007, um, and so right off the bat, you know I wanted to age two years in oak. Um, but I, I, as I said, I got the uh, Sangiovese and Merlot from Red Willow in 2007. Um, I wanted to make bold wines that would age for at least a decade and more. And I wanted, I'd had some experiences with old wines, but not a lot because old wines can be expensive. Um, so I set out to make wines that I could age for 10, 15, maybe 20 years and experience them and see over time so, so the whole, you know, make a half barrel at least of wine, you know, it's 11 or 12 cases. You could age that for a while and then start drinking, you know, a case a year and just see, you know, what, what's the wine like at three years, at four years, and eight years, and 10 years, and 12. And, mm -hmm. and I'm still doing that today. I've still got some wines from 2007, 2008 that I'm continuing to uh, experience and see. What have they done uh, over time? Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a fundamental goal, and as a hobbyist, I could do whatever I wanted. I didn't need to, you know, worry about getting wines to market and getting money back for them. And and uh, as I said, I was gainfully and full-time employed, so I had some some money to spend on this hobby. And and so I set out and I did it. And like I said, it by 2009, uh, the realization that gee, if I'm going to have aged wines, I better make everything I like. And so I started making at least 12 varietals every year and, and really haven't ever looked back from that. So that raises a couple of interesting challenges. Obviously you have a limited space here, so you have to be thoughtful about all, where all your varietals are going to go. We also have to find sources for all of them and, and deal with the different characteristics. Tell me about the kind of learning process for you of, of working with that many different varietals at a time. Um, I've been very fortunate from the source side in, in finding good quality vineyards and then sticking with them. I haven't jumped around a lot. Um, we're still with, for the Big Red, still with two vineyards. We started with the Red Willow in 07 and the one in Horse Seven Hills AVA in 08. And uh, I've moved around some in the vineyard, but from a commercial point of view, we get the same rows and blocks year after year. I know the people well enough now that I can give some input into uh, some of the pruning and farming practices that meet what I want. Um, and beyond that, it's just been, it, it's just been, hey, I like a dolcetto, so maybe I should make dolcetto. I bring that one up because when I made it, I realized I didn't like it as much as I thought. And so that's one that I, I made a couple of times and then didn't make again. Um, but I like Syrah. I like uh, the big Italian reds. I like Bordeaux reds. So. Uh, liking them and having experienced them from multiple wineries both here in California and Washington. Um, I had some background in terms of palate and experience to be able to go and say, okay, I want to make a wine like this. Uh, and actually, an interesting little side story. Uh, I'm also very handy, remodeled this property, remodeled the house before, I've helped friends remodel them. I, I've got, you know, a dozen skills, master of none, as they say. <laughs> Um, I did a bunch of work for a friend that had been collecting French wines since the 70s. Uh, did a bunch of work on his house to get it ready for sale as he retired, um, an older friend of mine. 
he gave me a couple of bottles of wine as, as payment for that, just as thanks, and, and made this comment that I would need a trust fund to go and buy these wines on my own. <laughs> He'd bought them uh, on release um, from, the, from the vineyard, uh, from the wineries in France. He'd bought them on release and had aged them for 20 plus years. Um, we actually opened one of those $600 bottles of Cab Sauve, Bordeaux, French Bordeaux Cab Sauve when we were crushing our 2010 Cab Sauv. And it was, you know, when do you open a $600 bottle of wine? I'd never opened one before in my life. Uh, but we chose to open it when we were grubby and messy and crushing fruit and saying, I wonder in 21 years if our wine can be like that. Mm -hmm. um, we'll find out. I bottled some three liter bottles of that wine and we will find out what it's like in 20 plus years. Um, so it's, it's those kinds of experiences that you go, okay, this is pretty cool. This, this wine has some real smoky, tobacco, leathery qualities. Uh, how, do I, how do I get that out of these grapes, right? I mean, you're tasting grape juice that's full of sugar. It's a way different experience than this wine that's aged for 22 years. So go buy a book. Go, go call some mentors. Go do some reading. Study on the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, just, I keep doing that every year. Um, and, and it affects our winemaking style and what we do and and we're you know I, I like to say we're after the, the the pursuit of that nirvana of wine that really is just you, you just enjoy every bit of it from the first pour out of the bottle to the last drops with all the different varietal characteristics there I'm also curious about you, you it's a lot of different goals to hit for a lot of different kinds of wine tell me about kind of mastering that part of it, of, of what these wines should taste like to you at, as you're getting ready to bottle them and, and, and on, on down the line? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's been a lot of experimentation. I like to call the, the first seven years as our R&D years and the last seven years as commercial years. Um, I, I think I've been extremely lucky, fortunate, intuitive or wise maybe, but mostly probably lucky and fortunate. Um, of the 77 wines made as a hobby, you know, throw Dolcetto out of the mix, uh, the rest have all been very drinkable. Um, I've had problems to overcome, challenges, I learned about egg white fining um, and uh, to get a wine to settle out. Um, and so, you know, every time you have a challenge, you go, okay, how, how is this solved? You go read about what's going on in the industry. Um, you know, I subscribe to Wine Business Monthly because there's interesting information in there. Um, used to, to, to subscribe to Winemaker Magazine as a, as a hobbyist because there's people contributing in there um, at a different scale, so that gets hard to, to, to replicate as you get bigger. Um, but you go and learn. And, and again, lucky that most of the wines have not presented huge problems, um, but maybe fortunate that some have presented problems here and there so that you are forced to learn. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to understand the science side of it, so very early on learned all about testing. We do all our own in-house testing, um, even down to testing ABV. Um, have just learned it all, and, and that gives you another view to, to how to work with wines. We pay a lot more attention these days to, to acid and pH, to sugar levels. Um, I'm not trying to make a bunch of big, bold alcohol bombs. I want to make a wine that you know, if you open a bottle and enjoy it with your wife, you're not, you know, feeling half hammered as you as dinner gets on the table, right? But that you can just keep enjoying it with the food all through the, mm -hmm. the course of a meal. Mm -hmm. um, and so that means pay more attention to where's the bricks at when you harvest mm -hmm. and, and do you need to make any adjustments. Um, and, you know, maybe another piece of trying to extract out uh, each varietal characteristic we pay a lot of attention to a couple of things. One, uh, obviously the science part of it, but uh, another piece is um, very early on I, I experimented with a lot of yeast. Mm -hmm. We would do these small batch fermentations and do, you know, maybe a half ton of Cab Sauv and ferment on five different yeasts. Um, that 2010 Cab Sauv, we actually fermented on seven different yeasts. It was, it was three quarters of a ton. We fermented on seven different yeasts and kept them separate all through mallow. I mean, it's a lot of carboys back then. Obviously don't do some of that stuff today. But it was an experience to, to take the wine all through malolactic, get it settled out, 
after its first sulfide addition mm -hmm. and say, okay, I, now I want to get this in barrel, I get all these carboys around, we, uh, we tasted through every yeast and we got out the, the yeast guide and said, you know, it says you're supposed to be able to find this or it brings this to the party and we could find that. We could, we could taste it, we could smell it, we could feel it in the palate. And so that led to, you know, still today we fill, ferment on multiple yeast every batch. And, and we continue to research, you know, what's you, new in the, in, the, in the yeast world out there. Um, this obviously answers another question. I don't do native yeast fermentation. Um, if I did a native yeast fermentation here today, who knows what it would be because I've used so many yeasts over the years and they're obviously growing in my environment. Um, we don't always have to add malolactic culture because that's growing here enough that it kicks off. Um, but I like, I like this multiple yeast thing to bring the best out of different varietals and to, to be able to get, you know, one that really focuses on fruit and upfront uh, mouth feel and the nose and the aroma and all that. Mm -hmm. And another one that really brings uh, body and texture to the mid palate. Um, so we'll continue to do that. We continue to do that. Um, we don't hold them separate. You know, once we press, it all goes together. But we've got we've got enough experience that we know that's not going to be a problem. And if we ever uh, like, we're using some hybrid yeast now. Um, you know, we can we can do small batch fermentations and really keep those separate for a little while if we want. Um, and it's it's experimenting like that that makes wine fun. Wine is. Wine is alive, as you know. It you know it transforms and changes over time. You know during fermentation, during uh, aging in the barrel, during aging in the bottle, and it's just it's just quite an adventure to experience that over time. Mm -hmm. And and you know it's great being in the industry now because it's a lot easier to go and experience that what other people are doing mm -hmm. and see what they're doing and what they're extracting out of stuff. Um, you know, heavily dominant Pinot Noir, of course, here in the valley, but we uh, we make it to Southern Oregon, we make it to Eastern Washington, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know, constantly uh, trading wines and buying wines. We never never stop buying wines. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much you make. <laughs> um, so. And then the, the, I talked about the yeast. The other characteristic that we play with is, of course, oak, mm -hmm. um, and we. Uh, we use French, Hungarian, and American oak. Um, American oak today is now all northern, predominantly Wisconsin and Minnesota oak. I want that slower growing, tighter green oak. Um, some, some Missouri oak experiences have, have made me thinking my wine smells like the two by four of oak I just ran through a table saw. <laughs> that burnt, pungent, you know. I love it on my bourbons, but on, uh, on my wine I want something more mellow. So I, I tend to use uh, uh, sometimes single mill series Minnesota oak, um, but typically a northern blend of Minnesota and Wisconsin oak. Mm -hmm. um, French oak from a couple different suppliers and Hungarian oak uh, from a couple different suppliers over the past, but predominantly one supplier today. Um, so, and, and then, you know, where's the oak at? Um, my Pinot Noir never touches a barrel that hasn't had anything but Pinot Noir in it. Um, you know, there's something about Pinot that you, you treat it, you know, just a little more special. Um, and then some wines, like the Sangiovese, um, is always in neutral oak. Um, we do blend in Merlot for a super Tuscan style. And, and oftentimes the Merlot get, you know, two year, three year, and every once in a while, one year oak. Mm -hmm. um, so we get a little bit of oak in the Sangio from that, but it's, it's only a, a five to eight percent add, so it's not, not going to change it too dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, looking at all that, and, and every year it's, you know, you start the planning process. What are we, what are we doing? Is anything changing in our varietals? Are we going to try anything new in barrels? And are we going to try anything new in yeast? Um, and then it, from there on, it's just managing the science of it, um, trying to keep your fermentations from not getting too hot. Um, I like them to go, you know, fairly slow and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, really work on, on getting uh, the best out of the fruit that year. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned the, the two years in barrel was something you came in with this, this idea of. Tell me about 
what that, what to you, what that does to your wine? What, what does the two years in barrel get that, that, that it wouldn't otherwise? You know, somewhere, somewhere around 16, 18 months, I think the wine really hits its stride in barrel and there's really a nice transformation and it really, uh, it really gets smooth. And then we age for another four or five months after that. When I say two years, it's because of the space, <laughs> we have to move on and, and get ready for the next vintage. So we're about 20, 22, 23 months in, in barrel from the, when you harvest and get it to barrel and then, you know, we're bottling before harvest to make room. Um, so that, that transformation that happens at 16, 18 months really, really makes a difference. And it's, it's just worth that extra time, in my opinion. Um, and we can talk about it at some point, but we make a, a Bordeaux style blend we call Triomphe. Um, and we actually age those varietals separate for the first 16 months. So at 16 months, we make our Triomphe blend. So we've aged the varietals, the five principal Bordeaux grapes, and for anybody that's watching that doesn't remember what those are, it's Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Malbec, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. And uh, so we've aged them separate. Today we bottle all of those as single varietals except Merlot. Um, and Petit Verdot is, uh, the very first one was 2017, which we're currently selling. We've just released that uh, uh, in October. And, uh, and we will continue to do that as a, uh, as a single varietal. When, when you talk about Cab Francs, Petit Verdots, having those as single varietals, it's, it's my cellar club and my fans and my helpers that have tasted them along the way and go, you need to bottle this separate. Um, so we listen to them, <laughs> uh, why not? And, uh, and, and in the hobby years, you know, we bottled all that stuff separate, right? Because we didn't care if we bottled two cases of Merlot mm -hmm. and the rest of it went into our blending program. A um, little harder to do that commercially. You know, you, you try to figure out where it all goes. And we will bottle two cases of Merlot still, but it all goes unlabeled and gets paid out to workers um, and helpers. And, you know, the many, many, many winery lunches that we do during harvest season and bottling season. Mm -hmm. um, so we sit down in March of every year, and we'll do that with the 2019 barrels that are hiding out back here, and come up with our Triomphe blend. Uh, same eight people have been doing it since 2011. We, we taste the five wines, we evaluate them, and we, we have a two to three hour blending party where everybody's making blends, keeping notes, and uh, uh, you know we have three simple goals. The, the Triomphe has to include some percentage of all five wines. It should be better than the sum of all parts. And we should have a lot of fun doing this and a lot of fun drinking the wine later on. Um, so we make that wine and then it goes back in barrel um, and is aged until Labor Day weekend. It's always bottled on Labor Day weekend. It's kind of our last bottling of the year, typically. Um, and then it's aged in bottle for 14 months, released to the public on Veterans Day. Um, and released to our club a couple weeks before that. Um, good segue to talk about why Veterans Day. Um, the uh, other founder, owner, winemaker of Resolute Cellars is uh, my son Cameron. And, uh, and that all started when he called me from the, the sandbox of Iraq in 2009 where he was a Marine, uh, still is a Marine, um, and uh, called and said I want to come home and make wine with you. Uh, I started making wine uh, at the time he left for the Marines. And so his, uh, his time for renewal was up and he decided he wasn't gonna renew. Wanted to come home, use his GI Bill. He went to the Northwest Wine Study Center at Chemeketa. And so he's the, uh, the book and school educated winemaker on the staff and I'm the uh, you know self-taught mentors books and and hands-on learner mm -hmm. uh, of the team um, and that's great because it leads to some interesting discussions especially while he, while he was going to school and learning stuff um, it was great because he'd come home or he'd text from class and uh, and there'd be a long discussion ensue on on uh, sometimes I was doing it wrong <laughs> no <laughs> um, uh, but I was doing it in in the style that I'd learned or in a style that I'd perfected on my own and and uh, it was great discussions, and we've we've both learned and changed over that time, and 
and hopefully reflected in the wines that we put out today. So I'm curious, you, had, you mentioned the kind of the R&D years uh, of just hobby wine. Tell me about, in that process, was, were, were there surprises along the way for you in terms of winemaking as a, as a, as a hobby? Was, were there things you learned about the process that surprised you, or was it fairly what you expected? Um, right, the, the equipment's expensive, <laughs> the, you know, the space needs, the barrels, um, you know, grapes are cost. It, it, it was an expensive hobby. Um, but in some ways it wasn't that hard. And, and you know, a little background, I've been, I've been cooking since I was 10 or 11 years old. I grew up on a farm, um, you know, was working in the fields as, a, as an eight year old or something. I was driving tractor when I was 11, you know, so, so being around food and farming, you know, canning that stuff, uh, you know, learning how to cook as a, as a young person, you know, I've been cooking all my life, and to me, winemaking is is an extension of that. And because the end product, wine and food, are you know a marriage made in in heaven, you know, you really, if you've got the the skills I had in 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 cooking, you know, very quickly lent to the winemaking side. Um, I like to say I'm not really a baker. Baker requires too much paying attention to recipes and science. Um, and winemaking has just enough. I got to pay attention to the to the science side of it, um, but there's really no recipes, mm -hmm. right? And when it comes down to to yeast and how you age and how often you rack and do you do you do stuff on the leaves? Do you get off the leaves right away? Um, all those kinds of things are are more style and art choices than uh, what I would call recipe choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Um, other surprises, you know, you learn things all the time that are surprises, like you put egg whites in wine? I mean, come on. Um, but I had a, uh, uh, the 2009 Pinot Noir after 14, 15, 16 months was still, I would call cloudy. And so call around and, and get out books and research and you find out that some Frenchman 300 years ago figured out, you know, and he probably called his friend that was a chemist or a scientist and said, you know, I've got this issue and they determined it was protein haze or whatever they determined. They said, you know, egg whites. Um, so I egg white find a whole barrel of, two, a full size barrel of 2009 Pinot Noir, you know, based on the recommendations of some books in a, in a, in a winemaker I knew. And I, you know, I thought, this is, this is stupid. I'm gonna be dumping out this whole barrel. Um, in three or four days, that wine was crystal clear and gorgeous. And it's like, aha, they're right, this works. Um, so surprises like that that you, that you, you don't expect. Surprises on uh, Gewurztraminer is a pink grape. Mm -hmm. um, you know, white wine doesn't always come from white grapes. Um, and, and surprises like, oh, okay, I kind of understood this, but all grape juice is clear and, and all that color and, and a lot of the interesting stuff from wine, in wine, is coming from the skins mm -hmm. and, and the pulp and such. Mm -hmm. So um, more surprises like that. Mm -hmm. More surprises on, on just the, the characteristics of oak maybe mm -hmm. um, in, in getting to play around with that and seeing the nuances of, of Hungarian oak versus French oak. You know, and then you go study it and you find out it's the same species of oak. But hey, like grapes, it's, it's terroir that makes the difference. So um, the, the minerality in the Zemplin forest in Hungary really brings something different to the oak than, than some of the forests in France. So um, I, those are all fun surprises. Um, even, even the egg whites is a fun surprise because you learn, hey, this, this is different, but it works. And, and hey, it's been working. Some guy figured it out. I don't remember the, the, the time frame, but it was, it was hundreds of years. It was a few centuries back that, uh, you know, some crazy Frenchman put egg whites into, into wine, right? <laughs> and uh, just, just fun stuff like that that really, uh, and then you see the result, right? And, uh, and I still have three bottles of that 2009 Pinot 
that are down to the last ones were, you know, open one a year until they're gone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that's a fun thing, right? Because you wait for the right people to be in front of you and go, we should open this wine and see what it's done. I still have one or two bottles of that 2007 Merto Pino. Um, it, which reminds me of another story, a real fun one that I think Mike and Robin will appreciate. Um, Part of my journey to, to even going there in 2009 and saying, hey, this Pinot is pretty good and I'd really like to make it again, is, is two of my friends that uh, I asked to come over and sample the wine in 2009 and, and give me some input on it. And uh, one of them came over after we'd been out wine tasting at commercial wineries and came back and, and he said, this is as good as everything we've tasted today and better than some. And, uh, and another friend that's, that considers himself a wine snob that's actually part of our Triumph blending team today um, came over and said, man, this is really good. And so those two guys started talking me into, you need to get these grapes again. And I'll be, you know, upfront and honest and be tarred and feathered when this gets out. But I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not one of these guys that, Pinot Noir for every day and every meal, and it's it's the only wine out there. I like a lot of different wines. I like Pinot Noir, um, but at the time in 2009, and saying you know I, I need to make different wines, and I want to experience all the wines that I've loved over all the years, which is you know dozens of varieties that I've explored and experienced. It's like maybe I won't make Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Well, they talked me into doing it. I went back. It turned out to be an awesome relationship with with Mike and Robin. But in 2018, in the actually, I believe it was in the in the winter of 2019, February or something, we had Mike and Robin over, those two guys, their spouses, and we opened Pinot Noir from Murto Vineyard from 2007 through 2015. And uh, I mean, what a, what an experience, right? To be able to. To do that, um, I didn't make any because of the two years in, in Oak. I didn't get any grapes from them in 2008, but they bought a, brought a bottle of their 2008 Cleo's Hill from the vineyard, and uh, and so we had this this awesome experience of lining up um, all these wines and uh, and experiencing them. And uh, you, you know, you just can't you can't do that every day, mm -hmm. um, and it's it's a it's it's fun. Mm -hmm. And like I say, someday we'll open, you know, that last three liter bottle of 2010 Cab Sauv and say, gee, was it as good as what we remember 25 years ago when we had that 25 year old Bordeaux wine? So you mentioned, you, know, you talked about going, going commercial 2013. Tell me about the, the process. What, what, what led you to eventually decide it was time to go commercial? And then how did you get things started? Well, we were, Part of the process was, was looking and saying, all right, I've got this much wine. I, I, have, I have a cellar right behind that tool cabinet, um, a little 48 square foot cellar that's jammed full, but I still have a locker downtown at Willamette Wine Storage with uh, north of 100 cases of, of wine from those R&D years. Um, it dwindles down because we give a lot of it away and, and drink a lot of it ourselves. We don't drink much of the Resolu until it's been opened for some other purpose. Um, and one day there'll be a nice party when I start breaking into the 27 cases of magnums from the R&D years. But, so, so you look, you, you know, 27 cases of magnums, I've got these three liters, I got one six liter bottle and you got all these other bottles and I kind of started doing the math and go, if I don't share any of it and I just drink it, you know, it'll, it'll last way beyond my life. And so, and by this time we've developed a pretty good fan base of people that are coming over and helping that we're sharing wine with, uh, we're sharing wine at restaurants and sharing it with servers and, and, and you get this repeated, where can I get some of this? Can I buy some? And as you know, it's illegal to sell it. So uh, I gave a lot away. We were, we were going through, you know, 40, 50 cases a year, sharing wine, drinking it, giving it away. Um, but spending a lot of money to do that. So you, you kind of want to balance that in your life too. Um, so it, it was this, you know, and, and when Cameron came home from the Marines, you know, it was all with the goal that maybe someday we'll open a winery. It was, that was talked about from 2009 on. Mm -hmm. One day, let's have a winery. This would be really cool. Father and son making wine. 
Um, there's now a third generation, we call them winemaker third gen, um, a grandson that'll be five years old next month, um, that uh, loves to come out and pat on the barrels and, and bang on the tanks, but I haven't got him uh, uh, sniffing much yet. He doesn't see any interest in that. Um, but, uh, you know, wouldn't that be great if, if one day he gets the same bug and wants to make wine with his dad? Mm -hmm. And so that had been talked about, um, but I'm still looking for my rich uncle to help fund all of it and found him. And uh, so we knew somebody at the city that was in the development office and, and, and he said, you know, you can do a home-based business in Beaverton and, you know, maybe there's a way. And so we started looking at, you know, what are the requirements for a home-based business in Beaverton? Um, and as you guys saw, as you, you came back to our, we're sitting on the crush pad right now, you know, when the rolling gate goes closed, we're separate from the street, there's no visibility, and we've tried to keep a low profile. And, it, and it's amazing to this day, getting new club members and they go, you're where? <laughs> I drive by your house every day. It's like, and you've never seen me? That's a good thing. Um, so we've kept that low profile in, in the last uh, seven years of commercial winemaking and, and have not had a single complaint that I know of for, with the city, so um, that's good. But we, we basically went and got a city of Beaverton business license to operate a home-based business out of here. And then I spent four months, five months negotiating with the feds on why it was acceptable to have a winery here and how it could work and how we could be compliant and, mm -hmm. and bonded. And, and uh, once I got them on board, uh, the OSDC was pretty easy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd been doing my application there in parallel, but if the feds said it was okay, the OLCC was, was pretty much on board. Um, so here we are. Now we're, you know, kind of maxed out. Um, I am thinking about how I can uh, squeeze in another barrel or two this year because I want to do a coat roti that I haven't done, a coat roti style Syrah, which I haven't done since 2011. Um, and I want to do it for the first time as a fully co-fermented wine, not a blend in Viognier after the fact. Um, so we'll see. I have a spot. <laughs> I think I can get two more barrels in. It looks like Tetris back it's, there. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> getting it. You know, if it's two more this year, then it's got to be two more the next year, right? Yeah. And and, yeah. and have uh, both years because we tend not to. In fact, have never. We don't bounce around in the, on the commercial side, right? We offer the same thing year after year. There's been a little bit of of. Uh, you know, couldn't get enough Barbera for a couple of years, so we were only making our blend, which we call Vino Barbativo, a blend of Barbera and Primitivo. Um, we made Gewurztraminer, um, but then had issues with the with continuing to get a good, reliable source from the vineyard, and I just haven't gone out and found another source. Um, we added Chardonnay last year, last year being 2019, um, and are making the second barrel of it in 2020. First. First Chardonnay I made since 2010, and first time ever to try a barrel fermented Chardonnay. It was it was pretty nice last year, so we're making another one this year. And or last year was a half barrel. This year's a full barrel, um, and that represents the barrel represents about two thirds of it. So it'll be two thirds barrel uh, fermented and aged, um, and about a third that's uh, in glass, mm -hmm. stainless steel. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's. Uh, it's, I'm sure I would make five more wines if I could find the time. And if I, uh, my, my wife, who's, uh, I've, I've given over all responsibility for sales and marketing, because um, A, she's a hell of a lot better at it than I am, um, and she likes it, and it's a way to have her part of the winery more full time. Um, she's got to sell these, you know, 11, 12, 13 SKUs I bottle every year. Um, it's been 11, 12 every year. <laughs> I'm curious about, we talked talk a little bit about the space and you've mentioned it a couple times. I'm curious about how you can sort of conceived of this space and, uh, and how you set out getting the, mo the maximum out of it in the minimum amount of space. So what, what did you think you absolutely needed to have here and how did you kind of make this space work for you? Well, the, the addition was built um, for winemaking. Um, it, as I said, we did it in 2009. Um, you know, it, it, it was a... Uh, again, I thought I'd make wine in that little shed for five years that we built in 2008, summer of 2008, and 
2009 just happened to be a time, you know, when the when the market was was down. I know people in the building industry. Um, it wasn't that I got super awesome prices, all the lumber and, and some of the material prices were down, but I got super awesome labor because only the best people were still working. And and so, I, you know, when I bought this house, I always envisioned a shop here. Mm -hmm. It was going to be for woodworking and crafts and other stuff that I do on my spare time. But I always envisioned there'd be a shop here. Um, early on, it was a vision of two-story like the house and we'd have all this more space, but we really don't need it. So I'm glad we didn't do that. Um, Design-wise, uh, I could have gone maybe another foot or two wider, but I'm kind of at the setback for the property line there. Um, and if we step in the backyard afterwards, I'll show you why design-wise it's like this. It mirrors the single-story side of the house that's on, on the complete opposite side of where we're sitting. Um, and it was just, it was the right design. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it's about as big a space as I could get in the, uh, the footprint I have here. So, um, and they just make it work. You know, and there's a cellar there behind the door which creates a loft above it. Uh, with the open ceilings and you know that gets full of, of stuff that gets only used seasonally you know, I always say it's the bane of the wine industry uh, expensive equipment and you use it for very little time you know barrels are about the only thing that are in use all year round um, in bottles once you fill them and uh, so efficiency wise I mean it's grown uh, from the the first year of really only doing 175 cases to uh, we're just under 500 cases now. Um, and that growth has come with, how can I still get this done um, in this space? Um, you know, a little shocking story. We're, we're producing um, just over a thousand gallons of red wine every year. Um, so when we press, we go into settling tanks, uh, stainless steel variable capacity tanks, or I use a lot of flex tanks from uh, uh, plastic flex tanks from flex tank all thousand gallons goes in that 96 square feet of the shed it, there's always a drawing there's always a plan <laughs> um, but that came with a nice little surprising side effect if you fill that shed with a thousand gallons and put a tiny little heater on there in there and low low you can keep that shed at, at 54 53 5 degrees uh, for a month and go through mallow with, I don't know, maybe cost me a $5 bill every month for electricity, right? Um, so that became a nice, oh, let's do that. Everything's compact, we get it through mal, and then we go to barrel. Um, that benefits our winemaking program because we like to go pretty clean to barrel, mm -hmm. um, not clog up the, the barrel pores with, with a lot of sediment. And uh, that way you're getting the, the maximum benefit from the oak. Um, and it also leads then to we really only rack uh, two more times. Mm -hmm. We do one racking to get off the, the fine leaves uh, after about nine months. And, uh, and then we only rack when we blend or bottle. Amazing. So pretty low racking, just keep them topped up and uh, keep the wine happy. So there's, there's, there's letting my secrets go to the industry. <laughs> What do you want cons consumers to take away from your wines? Um, we like to think of ourselves as another option in the Willamette Valley. Um, being an urban winery has, has benefits and, and you know, a lot of cons. Um, obviously, I'm not approved for a tasting room space here. Um, that would violate the whole, you know, too much commercial activity on a residential street. Um, so just know that's a challenge for us, right? Where's our sales efforts? But there's a lot of people that, you know, love that we're close by and can swing in and pick up two bottles of wine, um, you know, and just uh, do curbside service, right? And, uh, uh, you know, being close to customers is nice. Uh, not having enough room is, is tough. Mm -hmm. um, so... You know, it was back to, uh, oh, the, the question, of, you know, what do, what do the customers see? They, they love that they can get these big, bold red wines close by. Love the Pinot Noir, too, and so they get that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we make a Viognier, and now we're making Chardonnay, and we typically make a Rosé of 
Pinot Noir as well. Although 2020, we did not um, because of all the, the tough yields in the vineyards. Um, and so it's, it's a way to experience a lot of Washington fruit without driving to Washington. And, uh, and we do some interesting things. We, you know, there's not a lot of Petit Verdot, for instance, being bottled out there. Cab Franc, some, uh, but not a lot. Um, our two blends are our, our, our Vino Barbativo, the Italian blend, and our Triomphe, the, the Bordeaux blend, are, are rich and, and luscious and, and a great opportunity to try something different that, that uh, others aren't doing. Um, and every year with those is different. We don't, we don't do recipe blends. Uh, you know, the recipe is, yeah, we're going to blend Barbera and Primitivo or, or we're going to add Merlot to the Sangiovese for more of a super Tuscan style. But every year it's sitting down and saying, okay, what do we have this year in these two wines? And, uh, and sitting down and doing bench trials with, with a handful of people and getting input and going, all right, this is where we're going to end up. So, um, something different. Mm -hmm. We we I think we're pretty moderately priced, which is which is nice. Um, and from a 2020 perspective, when when my seller club members watch this, thank you. Uh, they sustained sustained us last year. Um, some of them really going out of their way to to, to buy extra wine and and uh, kept us afloat. So seller club's been huge for us and very very thankful to mm -hmm. to them for uh, keeping us going. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, I'm curious about selling. You mentioned uh, making 500, about 500 cases of wine without a tasting room. Uh, so tell me about your, the, the, the sales outlets you, you've used so far and, and as you grow, do you see those changing? Uh, I hope they don't change um, because some of them have been, been loyal to us from the start. Um, after this is over, I actually have to deliver two cases to uh, the wine cellar uh, up in uh, Cedar Mill. And uh, she's been been a supporter of ours since since we first started releasing wine. Um, which, by the way, April second is our fifth year anniversary of selling wine. We released our first uh, first wines on April second with a nice little blowout party five years ago. Um, we've been customers of Erin since she opened the shop 17, 18 years ago. Um, and so quite an honor that she paid that back uh, by being a customer of ours when mm -hmm. we opened our business. Mm -hmm. um, and we're still a customer of hers. I, I managed to buy wine when I go in way too often. But um, it's because, you know, I don't do everything and I still like other stuff. Bubbles being one of them that, that's nice to pick up at her shop. Um, so I don't, I hope that doesn't change as we grow and, and get our own outlet for whether it be a tasting room or, or something else. Um, we're in four bottle shops right now um, and four or five restaurants. Um, in, uh, and I, I, you know, I don't want that to change. Mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they've all, they've all been good to us and good for us and it gives us another another avenue right to, to get wine out there okay. and uh, you know up until last year wine events were huge um, the last wine event we were in was Portland Seafood and Wine the first weekend in February um, our, our Cab Sauv was best in show double gold you know it, it, it looked for all purposes like 2020 was going to be the breakout year um, for us and of course, that changed two weeks later. Um, but again, we're very thankful that, it, that through our seller club and through our sales outlets and, and word of mouth, uh, uh, people have found us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So talk, tell me about 2020. Obviously, multiple issues in 2020 between the pandemic and, and the fires. How did you, how, how did the pandemic kind of affect your work and your business? And what did you do with grapes in the fall? So obviously the, you know, the big impact, as I just said, was you know, not doing events and, and out there doing things like the SIP and Astoria Seafood and Wine and Portland Seafood and Wine and, and stuff are, uh, are you know, huge opportunities for us to, get, to meet new people, to get new customers. Um, and so that was a huge impact to us and I'm sure it was an impact to, to many others out there. 
um, fires in, in fruit, um, we came out okay. You know, our, our Washington vineyards eventually got the smoke, but that was after it went out over the ocean and then blew back over. So it was really high level smoke at that point. I, I would say zero impact on our, our eastern Washington fruit. Um, for our Oregon fruit, we did uh, some micro ferments of the Viognier, had it tested at Oregon State University along with the, uh, the vineyard owner and, uh, and uh, didn't see any real you know, significant impact. There, there was some measurable stuff, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but nothing really that you could sense. And whether it was the lower yields or what, it's a freaking awesome being <laughs> It's It's got to be the best being a of the last several years. So, um, you know, or, or again, just the way we handle it and the way we're careful with it, everything is just in our favor. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, you know, yields were down, but that wasn't the fire issue. That was really the, the spring storms um, during bloom. Mm -hmm. and, and so that impacted us. And, uh, uh, you know, we'll see what comes about in three years when we're trying to release that wine and, and hopefully it's grown and, and such by then. So as you, as you look ahead to the future for Resolu, um, tell me about what you're kind of hoping for the, the next five, ten years brings to the, to the business. Well, as you, as you can see behind me, we're getting pretty maxed out here. And, uh, you, you know, we haven't, uh, we, we've had reasonable growth over the years. Um, we, we never set out to skyrocket in growth and double every year or anything like that. We just wanted to, to grow and, and, you know, from a personal standpoint, I wanted the winery to fund itself. Um, can only, you know, invest personal funds so long before you go, this has got to take care of itself or it's not really a business. And we're at that stage, thankfully, um, and have been able to, to, to get some new equipment to make life easier. We, we really, with a focus in, making sure nobody that's helping me out is lifting awkwardly or doing something right that's that's a risk. So we've managed to get a lot of good equipment that takes care of that. Um, and it's a lot of good equipment that we could grow with and expand with. So so when do we expand and get more space is really the, uh, uh, the nature of it. And we've been looking um, and we've been wrestling that uh, that internal conversation of move to wine country and be more traditional or stay urban and, and continue to, to be a unique, uh, serving a unique niche of people that, you know, almost want to uh, get something local and not have to go far. Um, we need to figure that out with a local tasting room, really, if we're going to stay urban. And ideally, it'd be a, a tasting room and a production space in, in, in one, uh, one building. Um, it's just hard to find those right now. Very hard to find those. Um, so we keep looking and, and keep uh, you know, looking for the right time when, when uh, you're very confident in sales and cash flow and all that, that you know, additional overhead uh, mm -hmm. uh, pays for itself, mm -hmm. really pays for itself. So, um, and we're, you know, we, we're, we're, we're starting to feel the pressure where you know, we don't want sales to outstrip supply and that's, that's the number we kind of constantly watch. And, and uh, again, are thankful that in 2020, really the Cellar Club and, and a few other just fortuitous things and a great Portland Seafood and Wine event, um, you know, we managed to grow a little bit and, uh, um, and, and keep ourselves covered. Mm -hmm. So for us, that wasn't, you know, it's easier than, than some of the big wineries, right, where they've lost a lot of distribution east or Mm. or uh, a lot of restaurants or local shops. I mean, we were smaller and we weren't heavily into those things. Um, again, last year was our, our fourth full year of selling, so we're still, uh, still fairly new in the game from a, from a sales point of view and a revenue and worrying about all that stuff. Sure. I often ask if there's uh, something you haven't worked with yet that you want to. You're already making a lot of different kinds of wine, a lot of different varietals. Is there still something out there that you're looking to work with? Uh, one of these days I'd like to, to make a port style wine. Um, it's, a, it's a big debate. I mean, I know it's a popular item to sell. Um, I have a fair amount of port in my cellar and I always forget to find the occasion to pull it out. 
it's, it's always something I buy going, this will be really nice on the right occasion, and then, you know, I forget to pull it out when I should, or, or I never get around to the right occasion. Um, there's a few varietals I'd like to work with. Um, as I said, I'd like to get back to working with Syrah in, in, in really a coat roti style Syrah. Um, we've made Viognier every year since 2007, um, pretty much all from the same vineyard. Uh, there's really only one year where we deviated. Um, so would love to get back to doing a, but I really want to find a, a, a Syrah that ripens at the right time so I can do a co-ferment. Mm -hmm. um, there's other varietals that people, you know, poke at me and want me to make. Um, in, in the, you know, the lesser known Bordeaux, a Cunois or a Carmenier would be, would be uh, nice. I've never made either one, so I'd like to, to work with those. Um, there are wines I enjoy. Um, you know, we, we could expand our Merlot production one day and, and bottle that as a single varietal. Um, and then my wife will speak in my ear and remind me that, you know, when we, when we have 12, 14 different available SKUs, um, it's kind of hard because you, you, you really don't want to put those all in front of a person because you, you can just overwhelm people in a tasting situation, right? So, so we never bring everything to an event, which also leads to people going, what, you didn't bring XYZ? I came here just to taste that. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but it's really trying to be focused and say, okay, for this event and the, trying to do a little bit of thinking of, you know, who's the clientele coming? Um, you know, what seven or eight wines do we bring? Not all 12 or 14 that are available. Mm -hmm. um, we typically have multiple years of Triumph available um, because in the early years I made I made that as a in a heavier volume, not knowing how fast sales would ramp up. It was a wine that I had no problem saying if I make extra of this and it ages for an extra 10 years, I'll be happy. <laughs> right? um, and so, so we still have a, a decent backlog of that. Um, everything else we produce in a in a fashion that hopefully it sells out and. Mm -hmm. You know, ideally, right, you sell everything out except your library in 12 months because the next vintage is on its way. We're more in the, in a lot of stuff in a, in a you know, 14, 15, 16 months. But um, unfortunately in Vignet, it's 10 months or eight months, depending on the year. Um, try to make more of it, but you know, I, I was hoping to make more this year and then yields were down, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's going to be a fantastic wine, so. It'll probably make it for six months once we release, but so be it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you came into the industry from the consumer side. You obviously had a lot of experience with a lot of wines. Tell me about your sort of early impressions of Oregon wine when you started becoming kind of familiar with the Oregon wine industry. What were your impressions of the industry and, and of the wines you, you tasted? You know, uh, that, that'll bring up a woulda, shoulda, coulda kind of conversation. Um, it's, it's interesting. I was out tasting in the Oregon wine industry in the early years. I didn't know it was the early years. I, I totally, you know, was just not aware of that fact. Um, I moved to Oregon in 76, um, still a teenager, so I didn't start tasting wine in Oregon legally until, uh, you know, in the 80s. Um, but in the 80s, it was still a very young industry now that I've learned more and, and studied more about the industry as well as about the winemaking, right? Um, wish I'd known then how young it was and wish I'd known then that, you know, I could develop a skill and a, and a, and a talent for making wine. Because um, who knows, I, I might have made a, a quite a different uh, path on life, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, I had two good two good careers at two different companies that spanned a lot of years and did a lot of things. They were, you know, two companies and I don't know, twenty jobs, mm -hmm. right? Where I I moved around, changed, and learned new things, and so and and some of that are, again, as I said early on, or maybe before the camera was rolling, were skills that I built that that helped me as we became a business and and we're selling wine, right? Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Founder, owner, winemaker, bookkeeper, you know, janitor, put all the titles on. I probably do them all at one point or another, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I can't, I can't complain about anything I've learned over all the years at different, different jobs. But um, the early years of the Oregon wine industry, I was out tasting. I was out finding, you know, little hole in the wall places like Oak Knoll and Elk Cove that years later you realize, oh, 
they were, you know, some of the fathers of the uh, 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 founders of the industry. Um, who knew, mm -hmm. right? Going up to Erath and tasting in in I don't know, 1987 or eight, right? And going, wow, this is a really cool winery up on this hill, and and it, in hearing that it had just been built, right? But no clue that this is one of a handful of really founding people in the industry. So. Wish I'd, wish I'd paid more attention to that side of it other than just this is cool to be on wine country and tasting and uh, and buying some wine and, and, and bringing it home and shoving it down in the crawl space to age for a while <laughs> and, 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 and finding it later and experiencing, oh, hey, I did, forgot I had this. And, uh, you know, those are, those are real treasures. Um, like many people, I, I, you know, thought California was the place to be for wine. Right, so made trips down there and experienced it. Um, I don't know, starting in the, the mid later 90, 90s, mm -hmm. um, you know, and again, kind of missing out on the fact that, you know, there's really something special going on in Oregon. Mm -hmm. um, my wife's from Myrtle Creek in Roseburg area, so obviously had opportunities to go down there and, and taste and experience wine. Mm -hmm. So um, it was fun, and it was it was a lot of what we aspire to be today which is you can come and taste with us and talk to the winemaker talk to the owners talk to the people that that get involved in the winemaking um, most of the people that that help me at events to sell wine and staff the booth are people that come and help me make the wine and and bottle the wine and get to experience it you know in barrel tastings and whatnot so mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that I was getting those experiences in the 80s and the early 90s, um, but we're trying to give those experiences to people today. And, mm -hmm. and so for those that want to nerd out, ask lots of questions about wine. Um, so yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, I, but I don't know that I would have had the, uh, the talent and passion for winemaking that I have today mm -hmm. if I had gone out and said, hey, I want to volunteer or help out at Erath in 1989, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Who knows? It could have been way different. Mm -hmm. So, but but glad that I was uh, was here and saw some of it, and and very happy today that I've you know read and learned more about it, and and over the years have have been able to meet some of those icons of the industry, and mm -hmm. and even just you know being able to meet the Murtos who had their vineyard I think for 30 years, and uh, and participate in their fruit that has gone into to many good wineries mm -hmm. and many good wines. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's cool. Mm -hmm. It's it's an industry, you know. I've helped a couple other people get started. I've helped some people jump through the licensing process because I went and figured it out. Um, and it's just, I mean, it, that's me, right? It, if there's something to learn and I should know it, I'll go study it and learn it. Um, and uh, and so I've helped others out, and, and that's something that's really cool about the industry. Is uh, is most people will. Uh, will talk to you and listen to you and answer your questions and and be helpful. Mm -hmm. What's what's changed about Oregon wine since you've been around? Obviously you've been like you said, you were there pretty early on drinking some of it. What are the biggest obviously it's grown. What are the biggest differences in, in the industry other than that? Um clearly it's grown. It's uh it's still funny. I mean, with my my job with IBM, I traveled quite a bit, and uh, it's still, you know, California is is the wine out there, right? It's it's interesting to be on the East Coast, and and Oregon wine, Oregon Pinot in particular, right, has a lot more uh, cachet and knowledge by people in, in the East Coast than it did before. Mm -hmm. But it's still there's still a long ways to go, in my opinion, and. Uh, and it's hard to it's hard to do. I mean, one you know one hurdle for all of us is is the archaic alcohol laws in various states and trying to have an interstate program where you can you can ship your wine to consumers or ship your wine to to wine shops. You know, and it's and it's different rules. There are states where I can ship to consumers, but there's no way I'm going to ship to a wine shop because I've got to go through a distributor and I've got to go through a big distributor, and all of a sudden. Now you're too small for me to deal with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's a challenge, and it's, I'm sure it's been a challenge over the years. So kudos to those that came before me that have really grown 
the knowledge and presence of, of Oregon Pinot and Oregon wines in general across the U.S. because um, that will make it easier for me um, as we get to that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's changed, it's grown. I mean, there's no question that you can get good wines in Oregon. I mean, that was proven years ago, I think, but I think it's, it's more common knowledge for people that come here um, and people that plan trips here just to experience the wine industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've met a number of those, and, and it's fun to talk to them. They come from Georgia or the Southeast or the Northeast or the, you know, all over the country. And they, they plan vacations just to come taste Oregon wine, and that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about the future for the industry? What comes next for Oregon wine? Oh, that's a good question. You know, for us, we get lost sometimes just trying to compete locally. <laughs> or co op is is it really is more of. Um, it, it, it's hard to know what comes next. Um, God, I'd love it if we, as a, as states or a nation, right, could come together and figure out the alcohol laws that, that would enable that shipping, right? Because there's no reason, you know, somebody living in Arkansas should be punished trying to get, uh, you know, six bottles of Oregon wine to experience them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how that gets solved, right? I mean, states' rights are important, and I'm a, I'm a huge believer in states' rights, so it's their right to write their laws, but there's some things where you go, couldn't we figure this out from more of an interstate commerce point of view? Um, you know, more in a, you know, Oregon, West Coast point of view, you know, I don't know what Oregon needs to do, but it's interesting as I got into this and as I said, do I want to start a winery and do I want to be in this business, right? You, you, you have to go look at the regulation side of it. You have to go look at the, the competition side of it, especially as a small player, right? I couldn't make a, I didn't have the funds to make a jump in and go, we're going to start out at 3,000 cases and we're going to go do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's much different. So you have to look at all that stuff and go, can I survive? And, and something shocking that I learned in, in that process was you go back to 2000 and you look at the Oregon wine industry and the Washington wine industry and they had a very similar economic impact on their states. Today Washington's wine industry has I think almost a tenfold economic impact on their state over Oregon. And, and, and I don't know, you know what the recipe of that is. You know, it, it's a tangle of of public and private policies and investment and and so on, um, but it's not something to ignore either. It's something to go. Why is that? Mm -hmm. And and honestly, from from our point of view, getting a large portion of our fruit from Eastern Washington, right? It's it's also caused us to go. Well, if we're going to move, you know, an hour away from Beaverton and be different, what if we move three hours away? What's the difference, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you start to look at you know, anything in regulation and policies and taxation and so on that make it easier, you have to consider it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you mentioned helping get some people into the industry, uh, the kind of the way you were helped in with, with some mentors and friends. Tell me what your words of wisdom are to someone who wanted to join the Oregon wine industry. Oh, um, You know, I think something that we did, it is cold out here. Um, <laughs> something that we did and something that we've really tried to stay true to, you know, I, I said, you know, from the very beginning that 2007 Murdo Pinot was aged, not quite two years in oak. We bottled it, um, I think in, uh, I want to say June. It was May or June. So we didn't go as long as we do today, which is late August. And uh, I don't know if there was an, imp I, well, I think there was an impetus for that. It was to get it in bottle and go to the Murdo's and say, hey, <laughs> this wine's pretty good. My friends like it. Can we buy your fruit? Um, yeah, that was the impetus to getting it bottled early. And, uh, but here's the deal. That, that wine really did transform in the second year in barrel. 
uh, or the second 10 months or whatever it turned out to be. Um, and it's a nice wine. It was a nice wine. And, and I learned that, that patience with winemaking. And so when we set out to be commercial, and so here's my piece of advice, you figure out the style of wine you want to make, the things you want to go into your winemaking, and then put the plans behind that so that you don't have to deviate. I've watched you know, more than one good winery, uh, a winery that, that I bought a lot of wine from in the 90s that doesn't exist anymore. They got caught up in their own uh, success, I guess, but their own thrill of the sale in, in serving customers and selling wine and moving it out the door that one day in an event I tasted a wine in February that was from the fall harvest and it was a red wine. And I'm like, how did you do this? And I got some story of, you know, cross flow filtration and happy dances and additives and it's like, I will never do that to my wine. Yeah. I was making wine at that point, well before commercial still. Um, but uh, I'm like, I'll never do that to my wine. So I, I, bought, I bought wine from them up until, you know, early 2000s. Um, actually late 2000, probably 2010 or 11 was the last time I got wine. And they don't exist today. And, and it's because they started jumping through hoops of going, how do I get more wine to the market faster to sell it? Um, and I just, you know, we, we've been able, we've been very fortunate, I mean, obviously low overhead here because we're not paying for some other space has been a huge help. Um, in growing organically, you know, ramping up the, the production to hopefully match the sales, and that's a bit of predicting, right, because you're 30 months out from harvest to, to release, and you really, you really, three years from making commitments with vineyards to when you're going to sell that bottle of wine mm -hmm. that you're buying grapes for, that you're committing to grapes for. Um, so we've been fortunate that we haven't had to deviate and, and you know, push wine faster to market. Oh, we're sold out of Viognier, so how can I get the next Viognier to market faster? And, and all of that, in my opinion, makes you start to do things that doesn't match with that original vision and in, 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 uh, goal or plan that you have for your wine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the things you want, I think, as a winery, and one of the things we certainly strive for is consistency, right? And I don't mean consistency in that every Cab Sauv I produce should be exactly the same profile and taste and flavor. It should definitely represent the, the growing season that came about. But it should be consistently good. It should be consistently pleasing. It should be, you know, all the things that you can do to make it, you know, smooth. That aging for two years, right, helps to soften the wine, soften the tannins, and make it uh, soften the acidity and make it smooth, mm -hmm. right? You should continue to do that. You don't get caught up in rushing a wine. And I just, that's my advice to somebody. So, so figure out your plan, right? I mean, it was an investment for us to make a vintage, put in oak, make another vintage, put in oak, bottle that first vintage and then make another vintage and put it in oak and about six months after that April 2nd of 2016 finally put some wine in customers hands and put some dollars in the bank mm -hmm. right, that's a, that's a commitment to go and I'm gonna pay for these grapes and barrels and bottles and corks and labels and ever, everything right but it means I'm still making the wine today that I want to make in terms of quality and consistency and in uh, you know something that hopefully makes an impression on my customers and leaves them satisfied. Mm -hmm. Alright, so the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask here today that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? Wow. As you can tell, I could talk forever. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. I, I mean, we're pleased to be part of the Oregon wine industry and my intent is to stay in Oregon. I've been here for... I moved here in 1976, so I've been here a few years. Um, and, uh, and my goal is to, uh, to meet new people and, and give them a nice surprise that, uh, you know, a really nice wine can come from Oregon. Um, it's not just Pinot Noir. I make nice Pinot Noirs. One of the most frustrating things, you can edit this out, but 
you know, you're at an event and people come and they go, wow, this is a really nice Pinot. And then they go, but I'm only going to buy your big reds because I'm in three other wine clubs where I get Pinot, right? <laughs> and and it, I don't, I, I can tell you how many times I've heard, man, this is a really nice Pinot. And, and a lot of feedback, oh, this is really good, this is really good Pinot. And then when they get ready to buy, they buy something else. Like, don't you want that Pinot? You went on and on about the Pinot. Yeah, I'm in three other wine clubs that I get a lot of Pinot, so I'm going to buy this. So we really only make today one barrel of Pinot. Mm -hmm. It's enough to keep our club members happy and sell a little bit, mm -hmm. but they really like our big red, so <laughs> you go with that. So. Well, perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time, for your hospitality you here today, and we'll go ahead and let you off the hook.